Professor Hicks. We are very much delighted to have you here today at LUMC. And uh, actually, uh, already um, from the 90s, late 90s on, when I was a resident, I've been a great fan of yours, reading all your papers. And yes, you are visionary. Uh, you always had a great sense of where the, um, uh, the science of our specialty was headed. And even more importantly, you had the intellectual power and drive to also realize your vision. And because you are not only the uh, uh, director of the clinical uh, department uh, at your uh, hospital, but you are also the scientific director of the preclinical laboratory, you uh, managed several times already um, to do the full translation from that uh, to, from bench to bedside. So um, I'm admire you very much and um, I have several questions for you. So first of all, I would like to know what you think about the uh, Dutch uh, nuclear medicine research. Thank you. Uh, I'm immensely pleased uh, and, and proud uh, that you've, you've recognized a little bit uh, uh, our work, but I, I barely recognize myself. I think you've, you've done me too much credit. Um, uh, I've been uniquely blessed, I think, to be in the right place at the right time uh, during an incredible period of growth in, in nuclear medicine. And uh, during that time, I've been delighted to observe the contribution that Dutch nuclear medicine has made to global nuclear medicine. I think as a community, you should be very, very proud of what's been done, uh, particularly in the areas of radio-labeled monoclonal antibodies and in image-guided surgery. These are areas that I think that uh, Holland has led the world uh, in my own particular area of in, in theranostics. Uh, the work that uh, was done in neuroendocrine tumors to me was absolutely seminal and uh, came out of, I think, a really a strong link between basic science and, and molecular imaging and, and theranostics, uh, which has been embedded in, in uh, Dutch nuclear medicine since many decades. And I, I have watched with interest uh, and, and uh, equal uh, admiration uh, of the work that's been done here. Thank you very much for your compliments. And actually, I'd like to know some more about your journey from diagnostician to journalistician. Can you tell us something more about that? Yeah, the, actually, um, my interest in, in nuclear medicine actually started with therapy. Uh, in the sense that uh, although I was very interested in nuclear cardiology, uh, while I was at the University of Michigan where they developed MIBG, I saw one of the first uh, treatments with MIBG in a patient with metastatic fear of chromocytoma. And to me that was an incredible eye-opener uh, to see not only the tumours shrinking, but also the patient's catecholamines, which was severely uh, limiting the quality of life in that patient, uh, went away even quicker than the tumours did. And to me, that uh, uh, really opened my eyes and changed my career pathway uh, from uh, a focus on cardiology to a focus on oncology. And so a lot of my work over the, uh, the last few years has, has really been about looking at both diagnostic and therapeutic targets, the, the, the theranostic aspect and uh, our work in neuroendocrine tumours, building on the work that Eric Krenning and Dick Kweckerboom did in, in Rotterdam, uh, and uh, PSMA therapy, uh, working uh, on uh, agents developed at the German Cancer Centre, uh, as well as developing our own theranostic pairs, is, is something that I, I think is, to me, the natural progression. And I've never been more excited to be involved in nuclear medicine uh, as we understand the links between biology and, and phenotype, which is what nuclear medicine has been so good at for so long. Yeah. Because you're now running a preclinical laboratory and you focus on um, uh, linking um, genotype to uh, imaging phenotype. I wonder, can you tell me something more about that? I, I guess most of us uh, understand that we are who we are 
because of our genes. We look like we do because of our genes, but we don't stay the same all through our life. We, we, we lose our hair, we go grey, we get wrinkles because of uh, progressive uh, impact of mutations and ageing and, and our environment affects uh, what we look like. Uh, and I think tumours are exactly the same, uh, that they start with a, a pre-programmed genetic basis that defines them as a tissue of origin, uh, but then uh, they subsequently undergo mutational change, and as they do that, uh, their phenotype changes. And uh, we're in a unique position to uh, assess phenotype on multiple levels with molecular imaging on a whole body scale. Uh, which uh, genomics and proteomics and, and immunohistochemistry simply can't do. And so we have a, uh, a unique opportunity to identify uh, that heterogeneity in phenotype uh, and through molecular imaging take it back uh, through molecular imaging guided biopsy to understand the genomic changes that are occurring. And so uh, at a preclinical level and also increasingly at a clinical level, that marrying of phenotype with genotype will deepen our understanding of the biology of tumours and also particularly identify therapeutic targets uh, for us, which is really the end game as far as I'm concerned. You know, we really want to cure patients. Uh, many of the therapies we have are effective against some but not necessarily all of the disease and we may need to sequence our therapies uh, to uh, address different therapeutic targets during the course of a patient's illness, uh, which is a great opportunity, I think, for us uh, in molecular imaging and therapeutics. Yeah. And do you think that the new technological innovations uh, such as PETAMAR and also uh, total body uh, PET-CT will give a new impulse on uh, uh, this uh, research teams? I think definitely in, in the research area, PET-MR, it, it has a, a very significant role to play uh, as long as we're, we're very clever in the way we use the multi-parametric data and we optimise the two technologies to uh, for what they're good for rather than uh, um, trying to be competing modalities. Uh, their complementary information, I think, can become very powerful. Uh, in, in that uh, technology. Uh, in the clinical domain, the real issue, I think, uh, from my perspective, is, is one of throughput, the cost versus number of scans you can do per hour uh, or per day, uh, make it almost an uneconomic proposition. Uh, I think the, the converse potentially applies with the whole body PET-CT. Uh, where you can have incredibly high throughput, incredibly high sensitivity. But more importantly, I think we're going to get into a domain where microdosing uh, of chemicals that, that weren't clinically applicable before, uh, just simply because of the short half-life or the low yields, suddenly become clinically relevant because you can detect them. Uh, we can do pharmacokinetic studies for much longer with the same administered activity and the same cumulative radiation dose. Uh, we can use carbon-11, which, because of its very short half-life, becomes impractical for doing you know, more than a, a patient or two. You can do either multiple patients with one synthesis, or you can image for much longer and get much more detailed pharmacokinetic information. And, and obviously the chemical uh, integrity of molecules with carbon-11 is retained. And you know, so for drug uh, biodistribution studies becomes a unique opportunity, I think. Um, and so uh, I th think, you know, particularly when we move to digital whole body uh, uh, PET-CT scanners, uh, the, the world will be the chemist oyster, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, the, the, the number of traces that will become available to us and also the regulatory hurdles to getting them across because we can administer them at much lower activities or much lower masses of the, the, the compounds so the likelihood of the pharmacologic uh, or off-target effects is diminished uh, uh, you know, by orders of magnitude and that makes it uh, much uh, safer to develop these uh, 
agents. I don't think they're, they're, they're unsafe anyway, but uh, in terms of convincing regulatory authorities to allow them to go into more routine practice, I, uh, to me it's a game changer. Yeah. Yeah, to me it's also a game changer, and actually it's on top of my wish list. It's a total body machine. I have one last question for you. This year you were awarded the International Cancer Imaging Society uh, Gold Medal. And uh, I wondered, uh, what does this mean to you? Uh, well, I'm obviously very proud to, to receive it. I think I'm the first nuclear medicine person to receive uh, this award because it is a, uh, largely a radi radiology society. I think more than 95% of the fellows are radiologists uh, by training. It's very heavily dominated by uh, radiology uh, colleagues. And to be a fellow, firstly, you need to be voted by your peers. And then to be given this award is also uh, voted by your peers. And, and uh, uh, I'm both humbled and proud uh, of that ach achievement. Um, uh, over the years, I've been very uh, open and very embracing of radiology. I believe I, I've, I've learned a lot of, from my radiology colleagues. Uh, uh, several of my imaging heroes uh, are radiologists who taught me important lessons about the interpretation of scans. Uh, one of uh, those radiologists told me the most uh, valuable instrument in the radiology department was the phone uh, that you called up the clinician asked and what they thought was going on uh, and then you could tailor your diagnosis uh, your, your report to to answer that either affirm it, affirming the diagnosis or or maybe uh, revising it uh, in, in a way that's um, acceptable to the clinician and, and so I've been very fortunate to have very insightful radiologists who are very patient orientated, uh, who have taught me um, the, the, the nuances of, of reading MRI and CT. And although I'm not uh, a, a radiologist by training, I, I feel that I've got a very strong grounding in that. And the fact that the, uh, the International Cancer Imaging Society has also been happy for me to be the editor of their journal, Cancer Imaging, uh, which means that I get to read a large number of radiology-based uh, articles, uh, has really opened my eyes to the complementary role of uh, anatomical and molecular imaging, uh, which I've always been a big fan of.